Hi folks, John with the Wingman 115 channel. Thank you so much for checking in. A little bit different setting than you folks are used to seeing on a Wingman 115 video. And at the beginning of the year, I did a vlog and I told you folks that I was going to shake up the channel a bit and start doing a little bit of a right turn. We're still going to try to put out the best high quality content that we can do. We're just going to shake up a little bit of the programming and kind of introduce some new ideas, new concepts, new things to the channel. With that said, a while ago, I was invited by my good friends, Colin and Stephanie McDonald. They're the owner and operators of Kit Fox Outfitters, and they've been a huge supporter of my channel. They're the official outfitter of the Wingman 115 channel. So every month they put on an event called Campfire Talks where they invite folks from the community, the outdoors community, to come up to their place up in Ramona, California and to do presentations, to introduce folks to different aspects of the outdoor community, to try to generate some excitement and to get folks outside doing stuff. So with that said, I packed up all my gear made the trip up to Ramona, and I did a presentation on my design of the Mount Laguna Knife by Work Tough Gear. Now, in this presentation, I do a deep dive into the background, my background, my thought process that went into the design of the Mount Laguna Knife, and we talk about it. So, pop some popcorn, grab your favorite beverage, sit down and enjoy, and folks, thank you so much for watching. Now for the presentation. I want to thank uh, Kit Fox Outfitters for hosting this event. And tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about um, my knife uh, and the thought process in the, in the whole from concept to retail on that. Uh, and with that, I put together a little bit of like a PowerPoint presentation, kind of give you a little bit of backstory about who I am. And that way um, you'll have a better understanding about my thought process that went into the design of the Mount Laguna knife. First off, let's talk about where it all started. I grew up in Northern Maine, Arusta County, Maine, in a little town called Portage Lake. And at, a lot of people think when you say you're from Maine, they always think that you're from a down Easter that you're from the coast. It seems like you're either from the coast or you're not from Maine. So this whole upper half is what they call the North Maine woods. And with that, I'm not sure, this is kind of like fall. I took that photo with my drone uh, when I went up to visit my mom a couple years ago, we were bird hunting. And that gives you an idea just of fall colors and just how thick those woods are up there. A lot of folks are probably familiar uh, with the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. And that is like on the East Coast, the pinnacle for canoeing and outdoor activities, fishing. It's just crazy, uh, the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. So this kind of gives you an idea of the um, countryside that I grew up in. It's a lot of bogs and then it's like hardwood groves and such. So with that, Growing up in northern Maine, fancy me in the, in the 70s with the uh, fancy uh, haircut on my mom and dad's homestead. My dad was a woodsman. He uh, did competitive shooting. We did a lot of hunting, white-tailed deer and such. And my mom, she was an avid outdoors person as well. This is her at 12 years old up at a logging camp. My grandfather was a logger and we're talking about back in the day when they used to yard timber with a uh, horse and just yard it out to the rivers and wait until springtime after ice cleared and then they would do log runs down to the lakes. This is the, the center of town, photo of my grandparents placed in the back. My cousin owned what was called the uh, Motor Inn. It was like a motel and a lot of hunters from out of state, they would come in and whatever they harvested, they'd hang in town as like, you know, showing your trophy off for bragging rights. In the thinking about the conception of the uh, Mount Laguna, I always thought about what was the blades that were carried by 
my grandfather, my mom, my dad, a lot of them didn't carry these six, seven, eight, nine inch uber high speed survival blades. Just no, nobody carried that. Maybe there was a buck knife that was probably six inches long. And that was probably the most that you ever seen anybody in the late 60s, 70s, 80s carrying. Um, one, we just didn't have the super steels that we, that we have now that afforded the designs. And we'll, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I get to San Diego and I'm this Mainer. I, I love the outdoors and I was craving some pine tree therapy. And I asked folks, you know, where can I go to, to get to some woods? I gotta, I gotta get into some woods because the city was driving me nuts being in town for any length of time. And they said, well, you just get in your car and you drive 45 minutes east and there's this place called Cuyamaca and Mount Laguna and there's a big playground. And when we're talking in the early mid 1980s, it was very, very rural back then. Uh, Santee was just a little cowboy town. Alpine was just a little town little places on the map. So with these places at that point were just very remote. And it, I was drawn to that because growing up in Northern Maine, where you guys saw how thick those woods were, that was like behind our house. That was our playground where we would go and play. So when I got out here, I started backpacking and I would do the sections of the Pacific Crest Trail. And then I started thinking about, well, what, tools are we carrying when we're backpacking? Well, if anybody's ever done any backpacking, they know that everything is ounce driven. As soon as you put that ruck on and you walk two or three miles and you're carrying that weight, it's going to, it's going to let you know. So like through hikers on the AT, the Pacific Crest Trail and such, that's why they're cutting the handles off their toothbrushes and just paring everything down to get the lightest weight. Well, as you can see, I'm carrying this uber high speed, big <laughs> backpack. Well, I learned really quick, right? <laughs> the next trip I started looking at, okay, what did I not use on this trip? Was it necessary? Then I started weeding it out, cutting it out. So my goal was to try to get under a 30 pound pack for a multi-day trip. And uh, that pack was not in the under 30 pound <laughs> at all. I think that was like a 90 or 95 liter. I was, I was like crazy thinking big is better. I, w I was wrong in that department. Okay. So I also had this passion for photography and uh, wildlife photography. And part of that was growing up in Northern Maine. Um, I joined the photography club in like when I was a freshman in high school, one, because all the cute girls were in the photography class <laughs> and I wanted to go hang out there and be with them, right? So that passion for like outdoor, like wilderness photography trickled over through the years. I've always had that passion. So when I had a camera and now with the cell phones, you always have a camera on you. Um, I started taking photos uh, when you're out, out in the woods enough, people go, how do you get shots of animals out in the woods? And I tell them, well, you gotta be out in the woods. You wanna find stuff, you gotta be out there where they're at and you gotta be out there regularly. So I would go out every day off. I would go up to the mountains and, you know, filming a bobcat. I, I chased this deer for like six hours up at Cuyamaca. We followed him. And finally I got to where he gave me the money shot where he was actually probably 30 feet away and he disappeared. And then my nephew goes, Hey uncle, he just peeked out from behind a rock and that, it's just how amazing how animals will disappear almost in plain view then come out. Here's another one. And it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a lot of scars on this deer just from the rut and from sparring. And that just an old, old beast right there. So it took his photo and just, just mass respect on that. Uh, some doe. A lot of these are taken up in Cuyamaca State Park. So it was easier to get up near the game there because they're not pressured by hunting and such. But here's a shot of like my playground. So I go up to Mount Laguna and in this area is uh, uh, 
I want to say Cuyamaca Peak, then Stonewall Peak, and this is near the Kitchen Creek um, Road area off Sunrise Highway. And here's a shot from that area looking like east towards the desert, um, towards McCain Valley and such. So growing up in Maine, I had this passion for hunting and it, and it didn't stop. So out here, uh, I got into high powered air gun hunting, a uh, small game. So I would go out quite a bit with that and then also um, hunt birds. And then I was into archery as well. I'm still into traditional archery. Jaime and I go out all the time as much as we can uh, getting out on game. So I'm telling you all this story as, as the background of my thought process in the development of uh, the knife that I designed. So in February 14, 2005, this thing called YouTube was started. And when it started, everybody was basically posting videos of trips and such. So in December 8, 2006, I said, you know what? I like going out. I like doing trips. I love photography and video. I'm going to start posting trip videos myself. So created a loco, started a channel, and then I started posting uh, videos of me going out on my adventures. And at that point, I was a, a scout leader here in San Diego in the Heartland District. And I was doing a lot of stuff, taking scouts out and doing a lot of like skills clinics and people were going, Hey, I watched your trip video on YouTube. Have you ever thought about doing a review on gear so folks could have a better understanding of one, how to use the gear and two, to check out the gear to see if it's worth the money of buying a piece of gear. Cause everybody's working hard for their money and you want to get the best bang for the buck. So I got a camera, got my little Jeep, that's my trusty mobile studio, and I started heading up to Mount Laguna to film, and I started filming just basically gear that I had in my garage that I used, and backpacks, tents, stoves, multi-tools, and such. And with that, the channel started gaining some traction. So with that, I've always had this love affair with knives just have as in woodworking as a young kid i've always had this fascination of like the old frontier guys on the buffalo hunts and you know davy crockett and daniel boone and all those guys lewis and clark and just the explorers and especially growing up in the northeast where there was a lot of basically wilderness area in our backyard to us we were playing we were Davy Crockett. We were Daniel Boone and messing around in the woods. And it was just a great time. And I started doing woodworking and Condor a couple years ago started coming out with these knife blanks. So I go, I'm a YouTuber. I go to SHOT Show and I'm talking with Joe Flowers. And I said, man, it'd be nice if a company made some knife blanks so we could make their own handles. And he goes, Hey John, why don't you come here for a minute? Cause new for whatever year we were, he goes, we're actually coming out with one this year. So I was like, cool. And they were affordable. I mean, you could buy these for like under $20. So I started buying these knife blanks. And then because I did a lot of woodworking, I incorporated both. So I would start making handles and this was made out of Coco Bolo. Uh, it's a hardwood that is kind of like in the tropical area of uh, Mexico and Costa Rica and all that Central America uh, area. Started learning the craft of metal and how things went together. And then what I would do is I would give them away as gifts. I'd go to a gathering or whatever and go, hey, you know, um, somebody would say, hey, I like that knife. Okay, here, it's yours. And then I would go and build another one, whether it's a Kephart or, you know, um, whatever type of bushcrafter blade that I happen to have at that time. So with that, I started reviewing knives because I just had this love affair 
for knives. So a fellow YouTuber uh, interviewed me about a week ago, and I was unaware of this till he said it, and I went back to go look at my playlist that I've reviewed 141 different knives. And um, that's not counting ones that didn't make it on video. So with that, I was at an event and um, somebody asked me, they said, John, if you could make your own knife, what, what would you do? I go, man, I don't know. I never really thought about that over the, over the years. You know, I was like, I'm this YouTuber, I'm a gear reviewer, but I'm not, I, I wasn't really thinking about if I was to design a blade. So I went home, the spark had been lit at that point, and this was probably about three and a half years ago. So I sat down with a piece of paper, and then I started thinking about all the people that I knew that um, were inspirational to me as far as like knife designers. So my friend, Matt Graham, this guy's living it. He goes out, he's lived in like a primitive hut for years. He's a hunter gatherer type subsistence person. And he goes out and he's using the gear. So he's going to know if something works or doesn't work. So through talking to him and some of his designs that he's put out that I've happened to test, um, and uh, some of it, as you can see, has that more primitive sort of uh, design to it. I would pick their brain and what steels are you using? Why are you using that? I was, I was just asking the questions because I wanted to learn. Next is Joe Flowers. Joe Flowers designs a lot of knives for Topps knives and for Condor tool and knives. But one thing Joe is, is he studies history. He knows the historical value of knives. He goes places to museums, to natural history places, and he, he, de he deep dives into a culture, and then he'll come out and design blades like the Bracamo or the Shango and stuff like that. And a lot of this, you can see, has more of a native type, old school, frontier type look to it. And then my buddy Andy Tran, I'd pick his brain because this guy basically forged his tops to Homa, the prototype, in his backyard. He's just hammering it out. You would think like in the Rambo movies, like Rambo 4, where he's just forging something out. He forges out his own prototype in his backyard. So I'm like, I'm picking these guys' brains about steel, about uh, design and things like that. So I have a good friend, Dan Eastland from Dogwood Custom Knives. I'm introduced to Dan at SHOT Show. We're sitting down with some adult beverages and then we start talking about steel. Well, who better to know about steel than somebody who actually builds knives for a living? So we start talking about how different composition of metal and the breakdown and all that stuff. And it's, you know, at this point, I'm a sponge. I'm just learning. I'm trying to learn as much as I can. So I'm asking as much questions as I can and, and all that. And this is some of the knives that Dan's designed. One, he, these beautiful custom knives, and he also does like chef knives. And then uh, he has done a replica of a Kephart knife. Now, he was able to get a original Kephart that Horace Kephart had that was owned by Ethan Becker. Let him borrow it. He could look at it. He could photograph it. Wouldn't let him take it home, but he could get the dimensions. So he spent a good amount of time. And this is probably one of the closest as far as being almost an exact Kephart that's out there. So, I mean, he is truly a craftsman. So I, picking these guys' brains, I learned a lot over the years on knife design, metal. I kind of had a good idea as far as being like a gear reviewer, what's gonna work, what isn't gonna work, because I've seen a lot of different designs like that. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but this is my original design that I drew out on paper. 
So I would go to events and there would be people that I trust in the community. One that I wasn't afraid that was going to take my design and call it their own and then make their own knife based on that. I would ask their honest opinion about it. And it's very scary when you ask folks your honest opinion on one of your like conceptual ideas because I mean, you can't take things personal at that point because you don't know what their thought process is in regards to use and the metal and such like that. So I, I throw a rough sketch out on the table and folks would go, well, I would, I would angle this and I would change this and I would make notes and then I'd talk to somebody else. And if two or three people were saying the same thing, then I made the change. So at that point, I finally narrowed it down to like this design. And I shopped it around to a couple different knife makers here in the States. I go, hey, look, I wanna do this. And they go, hey, we, we love the concept behind this, but what price point are you trying to hit? And I said, well, I've always been about value because everybody's working hard for their money. I don't know anybody who doesn't work hard for their money. I wish I did, probably make my life a lot easier, but I don't, everybody's working hard for, their, for the money that they earn. I said, I'm trying to keep a price point that's under $100. First thing they did, they laughed at me. They said, you're not gonna make a knife here in the States, retail value under 100 bucks, just ain't gonna happen. So the closest bids that I could get was like, lowest was like 260 bucks. Wow. And the rest, because one, we had to deal with tooling, we had to deal with mock-up, you know, steel that we're gonna use, all this stuff that goes in that a lot of people don't think about when you're just buying something retail, when you're thinking about the price of something. So I, I had to shelf my idea for a little while. So then I was introduced to Work Tough Gear and I did a couple reviews for Work Tough Gear. And I must say that they make phenomenal stuff at a very affordable price. One, Vic, who's over there at Work Tough Gear, has a passion for knives. He, he loves what he does. And it shows in the workmanship that, he, that comes out of his product. So first thing we did, I had to send Work Tough Gear my drawing on the Laguna. So they came out and said, you know what? We're gonna do a 2D drawing of it. And this was their version of it. Now, of course, that's the metric system, but um, this is what they came up with. And then we talked about it. And from that point, uh, they did a 3D um, model of the, in basically for a, a CNC machine. So they did a, th a, a 3D type schematic for that. So with that, we started talking about steel. Well, what steel do you want to use? I was like, whoa, well, wait a minute. You know, that got me thinking about stuff. And when I thought about blades and what the mission statement was for the knife and what I, I was envisioning people to use primarily. I designed it as a hunting and fishing blade, basically an outdoorsman blade. And um, based on the knives that my grandfather carried, my dad, my mom, people up in Northern Maine, most of the knife blades weren't over four inches. And it's not like today where people are batoning with their blade, and just going crazy town. Uh, a, abusing their blades and just going nuts. I mean, if we drew a blade, it was, I'm cleaning a fish, I'm gutting a deer, uh, maybe I'm, I'm doing a little bit of whittling in camp. But the bushcrafter thing, like today, really didn't, it wasn't like that in the late 60s, 70s, 80s up in Northern Maine, just wasn't. If I was batoning with a knife, my grandfather would have smacked me on the back of the head and told me to use my ax. It's just, just how it was. One, the steels aren't like they are today um, with the super steels. I, a lot of the 
1095 carbon steels and such with their heat treat, I don't think would have held up to heavy use batoning and, and things like that 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. I, they weren't designed for that. They were designed just to cut. So with that, I had tested out a couple knives from Work Tough Gear that had used uh, Bowler K110 steel. So I did my research on Bowler K110 steel and, and Victor was like, no, this is, this is some high-end stuff. So I went to go look and it's actually an Austrian company that makes this steel. So it's, Work Tough Gear is based in Taiwan. So 1095, D2, stuff like that's hard to get because it's imported and it, the price goes up. Well, the Austrian steel, for some reason, the way the imports are, he's able to get it and he's able to get it where it's affordable for commercial use. So a couple of the knives that I tested with Bowler K110 of theirs were phenomenal. The edge retention, their heat treat was spot on. We were cutting and chopping. We were doing abuse, I mean, way stuff abuse just to test. And it was just holding up very well. And it's at that borderline, like it's a D2 stainless steel. So that was right in the wheelhouse that I wanted to use as a knife. One, I didn't know the environment. Everybody's gonna use it in a wet environment. And if you're using a high carbon steel, what's the worst first thing that's gonna happen? You're gonna get corrosion. So if you don't clean that blade, like right now, as soon as you do it and put some oil on it, 1095, 1075, 1085, I mean, pick your 10, whatever, it's gonna corrode right off the bat and it's gonna start pitting and doing all that stuff. So I wanted to be able to have a blade where you could take to Alaska, you could take the Pacific Northwest, you could go anywhere, fall in the drink, and I mean, be in a high humidity down in a jungle somewhere and not worry yeah, you still have to do knife maintenance, but not worry that I got to take care of that blade right, right now when the priority is maybe getting that, getting that whitetail deer or catching that fish or doing whatever you're going to do. So we went with Bowler K110 steel. Now, when we originally did the prototype, and I still got all the crazy stuff on there from cutting and hacking and slashing, this is the prototype that we came up with. So first, before I jump the gun, Victor was like, hey, I wanna send you a mock-up of the handle. So pass that around. That was a 3D model of the handle. One, because as a knife designer now, and as a gear reviewer of 100 and something knives, to me, the most important aspect of any knife isn't the cutting edge or the profile, it's the handle. If the handle doesn't feel good ergonomically in your hand, you're not gonna use that blade. You know, it's gonna wind up just sitting on a desk or sitting in a drawer somewhere or in the back of the truck and you're just not gonna use it. And I've tested knives like that that had hot spots and, and such. So we came out and I, and I say we because it was a partnership between Work Tough Gear, Victor, who runs Work Tough Gear, and I. And I would give my thoughts, and then they would go, hey, why don't, have you thought of this? And I respected their opinion, one, because they've made a ton of blades, different styles, and they're the professionals, they know. So I gave it, a, had an open mind, we gave it a try. So this was our prototype. And originally we were gonna go with a full Scandi. So where that is, is that the edge of the, the angle of the blade goes all the way down to the cutting edge. But what we were finding with hard use is because we only went with 3 16 of an inch steel. I wanted to go with a thinner steel. A lot of these knives were just overbuilt in width. Some of them a quarter inch, stuff like that. I thought it was too much of a bar of steel for the length of the blade. So by going with 3 16 I figured is the perfect size. Remembering back all historically, a lot of the frontier knives were only an eighth inch thick. A lot of stuff that was used to 
carve up buffalo, carve up elk, I mean frontier style, was scent eighth inch thick stock. So I went with um, 3 16 So what we were finding is when we were doing hard use in the testing and evaluation of the blade that I wasn't getting good edge retention and sometimes edge would roll, chip. The last thing we want to do was go to production and somebody use a blade and go, hey man, you know, I used it and I'm chopping because you don't know what folks are going to use their knives for now. We wanted um, something that was going to be used for hard use because if you have to quarter up an elk or deer or whatever, sometimes you're going to have to cut through a joint bone or a knee, you know, whatever you're going to have to do. I wanted that blade to be able to hold up. So originally my thought was saber grind with a convex edge. What I found was over here, I'll, I'll hand this one around so you guys can check it out. Over the years I found for me, and your mileage is gonna vary because everybody's got different opinions on grind and edge and all that stuff. For me, a saber grind with a convex edge has worked the best for what I do. Whether you're doing feather sticks, whether you're cutting meat, whether you're doing camp food prep, whatever you're doing. A lot of people ask me, where did you get the, the blade shape from? Well, let me go back a little bit on this screen. I'm a big fan of a tanto and a drop point. So my thought process behind that is, as you can see, the, ang the forward angle coming off the front on the top leading edge, when you're cutting, if I can borrow that, yeah. when, you're, when you're cutting or you're, you're gutting a deer, you're cleaning a fish, I angled it so you could get the blade and use the cutting edge of the blade so you're not nicking or cutting a bladder, an intestine, whatever, and you're taining the meat of whatever you harvested. So as growing up as a kid in Northern Maine, I had a trap line with my grandfather. We trapped beaver, muskrat, sable, all that stuff. And most of the knives had some form of drop point up there. So I wanted to incorporate that. And then I angled the top a little bit just to take a little bit of the meat out of there. And then folks ask, well, why did you put the choil in the handle and not on the blade? And I always think back to my grandfather and how he handled a knife, either skin and deer, or we were skinning muskrat and beaver. And a lot of times he would take his ring finger and he would grab the blade and then he would hold it just like that. So whether he was cutting and cleaning deer or fish or he's caping out that deer or we're doing beaver, whatever, he's able to use that almost like a ulu style. He's getting in there, his fingers up close, he's touching the hide, he's not making holes, because if you're a trapper, the more holes that you put in a pelt, in fur, I mean, the price goes down, you're losing money. So as a kid learning, you know, he, he was very picky about what animals he let me practice skinning with, thank you. So my thought process, a lot of people think, well, how come there isn't a bigger choil there. I used it one as a little bit of protection so your finger doesn't slide onto the cutting edge of the blade. And then two, you can use it to skin, to carve, do whatever, some camp chores. You can get up tight. And I mean, you can, you can twist that blade pretty good and you have pretty good control of it because it's just locked right in there. Now, another thing is I wanted that drop point and I wanted the point center line with the blade. One, for balance, and two, if I had to bore holes in something, at least I could look down the blade and I could see the center line. So that was part of the reason why we went with the angle there, hit pretty close to the center line with the handle, 90 degree spine because a lot of folks 
Love their 90 degree spines now for raking a ferro rod or if you're into bushcrafting, you're, you're making some fluff with a, with a stick uh, for lighting a fire. And then uh, we had a bow drill divot put on. Now, I'm not a bushcrafter. I've never claimed to be a bushcrafter. But heaven forbid, if you're out in the wilderness, you go in the drink and the only thing you got on you is your blade I wanted to at least put some form of tool on there that gave you a fighting chance to maybe start a fire. So that was my whole thought process. And I put it on both right and left. So just for safety, if you ever do that, always put the sheath back on. And this is the prototype, it's going in hard. So here, I'll use this one over here. You know, you would take it off your belt and then with your sheath, you could hold it and um, do it that way. So that was a lot of the thought process that went in to the Laguna. Um, and as photos of, you know, the mock-up, the handle. And I mean, this knife has been tested out now by three or four other YouTubers. And I mean, the last one from, Eric from Outer Limits, they abused the hell out of that blade. I, I, I was nervous when I watched the video because they're stabbing cans, they're opening up a can with it, which metal on metal, you're thinking, oh my God, you know, what's gonna happen? And they were doing stab tests and cut tests and just very hard use. One, the heat treat was spot on. The edge, they were still cutting paper after he had just opened up a can of soup or something that he had out there. And I was just really impressed with um, how the whole thing worked. So that was my journey. That's my little Sasquatch in the, uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have any questions, uh, comments, uh, I'm free to answer anything that you have. And um, with that, that's my presentation on the Mount Laguna.